About a month ago, I was in Hawaii on the Big Island, or more formally, the island of Hawaii. And when I'm at places like that, what I like to do is go exploring, and so does my brother Nick. And so this time we both went on a bit of an exploration adventure together. And what we did was we drove up to the top of Mauna Kea, one of the extinct volcanoes on the island. And the thing about this one is, well, it has a whole bunch of fantastic telescopes up there. And when I say up there, I mean at about 14,000 feet. So that really is about the highest I've ever been when I wasn't inside an airplane. So what this video is about is not only the trip up there and what we saw and some details about the Keck telescope, which is probably one of the more spectacular ones, but really the type of information you need to know if you want to go on a trip like that too. And what I mean is we had a hard time finding out exactly what the driving restrictions and requirements were. And so in this video, we're going to cover all of that. So what should you consider before driving to the top of the mountain? Well, the first thing is pack some warm clothing, at least a sweater and a jacket, and probably also some long pants. Now, the truth is we didn't need the long pants on this trip, but it could easily have been a few degrees cooler and they would have been, well, really useful. Also, it is quite a long trip up there, so pack a lunch and something to drink. And most importantly, be sure to bring a 4x4 with four low type vehicle. In our case, we used a Jeep Wrangler, which we rented at the Hilo Airport. We did see various other types of 4x4 vehicles up there, such as pickup trucks, Pathfinders, Ford Explorers, and so forth. Now, it is really quite critical that you have something that does four low, and many car manufacturers have numerous variants of each vehicle. So just because your vehicle looks like a 4x4, it doesn't mean it is a real one. And so it's really quite important when you're renting the vehicle to make sure that it does have the four low setting in 4x4 mode. So after the nice long drive up to 10,000 feet, you do stop at the visitor center and it's highly recommended that you stay there for at least about half an hour or perhaps a bit more. And that's so you can acclimatize to the much thinner air. And while you're doing that, there are a whole bunch of displays and exhibits about the various telescopes and also, of course, a gift shop where you can pick up nice t-shirts. And anyway, that's exactly what we did. And as you're leaving the visitor center, there are actually rangers or equivalent who check your vehicle to make sure it does have four wheel drive, four low. And they also quiz you to make sure you know how to put it in four low. And for that matter, about your health because they really don't want anybody with breathing or heart issues or anything else that might affect the blood oxygen levels at high altitudes from going up because altitude sickness really is quite a serious thing and even if you don't have any of those issues healthy people like us can be affected and can react quite differently so the warning is in particular if you get symptoms like a headache or feeling nauseous come down immediately anyway we headed up and the road quickly changes from the nice asphalt at the visitor center to a fairly rough gravel road. Now, it's not a real issue if you're driving a 4x4 vehicle, which you inevitably are. So you keep going until you get to the ring road at the top, which is again paved, so it makes driving a bit nicer up there. Now, it is quite neat to be on top of that mountain because based on some definitions, it's actually the tallest mountain on Earth, at least when you measure the distance from its base below sea level to its peak, which is about 35,000 feet. Of course, at 13,803 feet, its actual altitude, it is nowhere near the highest mountain on Earth, but it's still kind of cool to at least be on top of the tallest mountain. 
As you're driving along the ring road, the first side road takes you to the top group of telescopes, and it ends at probably one of the earliest telescopes, which was the Canada-France-Hawaii telescope, which was activated in about 1979 or so. And apparently it used to have visitor tours, but not anymore, which is really too bad because it would have been nice to see. However, what it does have is one of the best websites of all the telescopes with some absolutely spectacular images that it's taken over the years. And what I'll do is put the link in the description below the video. And well, it's really well worth taking a look at. Now, when you're up there, it really is quite spectacular. Depending on the weather, you probably see a sea of clouds well below. And it's sort of like being in an airplane. You are at that sort of elevation, half the cruising height of a typical jet plane. And the other neat thing you can see is snow. If you've been there, you sometimes see it way on top of the distant mountains. Well, here it is and you can touch it. And I really wanted to make a snowball, but when I tried to do that, it turns out the snow there had been melted and refrozen and actually frozen right to the ground. But I did get a small piece, so at least I could say I've held a piece of Hawaiian snow in my hand. There were some fair-sized patches of snow up there, and from the tracks in them, it's pretty clear that somebody had gone skiing, presumably when the snow was fresh and not iced over the way it was when we looked at it. And this really interested my brother because he's an avid skier, and he's such an avid skier that he just recently published a book on skiing in Whistler Blackcomb, and, well, if you're interested in skiing, what I'll do is put a link to his stuff in the comments below. Well, once we were done at the top level, we went back down the side road and continued on the loop until we got to the Keck Observatory, which consists of two giant telescopes, each with 10 meter mirrors. Now, those mirrors were really quite an innovation because they were made from a series of much smaller hexagonal mirrors that are all attached in a big frame and individually controlled. And the really great thing is you can go in the building and there is a visitor area where you can actually observe the telescope and all its mirrors. And we were really lucky because the thing was actually moving. Not only was the whole mirror or telescope assembly moving, but also the dome itself. Now, to get all those smaller hexagonal mirrors lined up so they can behave as one giant mirror is no easy feat. And what they had to do was use active optics, meaning each mirror is controlled by a bunch of actuators that continually adjust its position as the telescope moves around to track the stars. And this turns out to be an incredibly effective technique. And I think the Keck really set the stage as how to build telescopes in the future. Now it has one further innovation, and that is something called adaptive optics. The problem that all Earth-based telescopes have is, well, we've all seen the stars twinkle. They move about because of turbulence in the atmosphere, and this, of course, distorts the image that the telescope looks at. For larger telescopes, and certainly ones the size of the Keck, the width of each of those turbulent regions in the atmosphere is actually quite a bit smaller than the diameter of the mirror. So on a day with good seeing, as they call it, those wobbly areas can be about 30 centimeters or so in diameter, but more typically they might only be 10 centimeters. So what that means is not only does the telescope suffer from the stars twinkling and moving around, different parts of the mirror see the star in slightly different places because it's looking through different parts of the atmosphere. And what that means is when you try and take a nice clear image of a star, what you get 
is a somewhat blurry mess. You still get all the light gathering ability of the telescope, but not the clarity that a telescope of that diameter should give you. And this is really quite critical because there are two reasons for making telescopes so big. One is light gathering, but the other thing is you do need a large size mirror or lens to get the type of resolution you want if you want to see things like stars orbiting each other or really minute details at enormous distances. So what adaptive optics is, is the idea that if we could distort or warp the mirror in such a way that it exactly counteracts what the atmosphere is doing to the light, we could remove all of that distortion and get something close to a perfect image. Much like the type of image that, well, we used to get from the good old Hubble telescope. And to put things in perspective, the Hubble telescope apparently cost a little over four billion bucks when it was launched at about the same time the Keck was opened up. And that was 40 times the cost of the Keck telescope. So how does the Keck and other modern telescopes do this amazing feat of optics? Well, what they need is a bright reference point near the object of interest, the object that they're trying to image. And they take the light that comes from the main mirror of the telescope and split it with a beam splitter to send some of it to a secondary sensor that's called a Hartman sensor, which is an array of small lenses or lenslets and a image sensor looks at the images from each of those tiny little lenses and uses it to see how much the reference star has wobbled for each area of the giant telescope mirror. And by taking that information and suitably processing it, they can use it to adjust a bunch of actuators on a second deformable mirror, which gets all the rest of the light from the beam splitter. And they deform that mirror in exactly the right way to essentially undo all the twinkling in the atmosphere. And the results from that are really quite spectacular. And it's used in numerous telescopes, not just the Keck telescope these days, because it is such an incredible way of getting so much detail out of these absolutely fabulous scientific instruments. Now, it's not quite as simple as I've described it. The deformable mirror has to operate very quickly, usually at the speed of updates every millisecond or so. But more importantly, it does need that nearby bright star. And unfortunately, there are not that many of those stars, at least when compared to the vastness of space. So the question is, how does one solve that problem? And the answer is the telescope makes its own star. And it does that by shining a bright yellow laser up through the atmosphere until it hits at about an altitude of 100 kilometers, a layer of sodium ions, and it excites those ions and they fluoresce and generates what amounts to an artificial star. So they can essentially do adaptive optics with a reference star at any position they want in the atmosphere just by shining a laser in that direction. Anyway, after a little bit over an hour up high, we both started feeling a little bit lightheaded and figuring that that was the onset of altitude sickness. We decided the responsible and safe thing to do was to head down and so we did. And the drive down is where you really need the four-wheel drive for low setting. And that's because of the atmosphere, which at 14,000 feet is only about 60% of the pressure that we normally experience at sea level. So it's a bit less than nine pounds per square inch compared to the usual 14.7. And not only does that make breathing a bit harder, but it also makes it much harder for a car's brake to cool on the way down. Well, when you're driving down 
such a large altitude distance, a lot of energy goes into the brakes and they easily get hot and they easily overheat. So what you have to do is put the car into low gear, so typically first or second gear, and set it to four low and hopefully drive down without using the brakes much at all to keep them cool because the last thing of course you want is the brakes getting so hot that they fail and bad things happening. The drive down is really quite spectacular because you are able to see all the wonderful views when you're looking down. Perhaps one of the most beautiful things are the cinder cones on the side of the volcano from the various eruptions that generally have ash in various colors and it can be quite spectacular particularly if the lighting is just right. There's also nothing like driving down and seeing the layer of clouds way below you. In fact you can look down and see the visitor center at 10,000 feet and the clouds way below that. When we got back down to the 10,000 foot visitor center the rangers were checking the temperatures of everybody's brakes and much to our surprise ours were apparently quite overheated and that was because even though we had been using engine braking and Nick had it in four low all the time what he was doing was changing between first and second gears to prevent the engine from revving too much on the way down well it turns out that was a mistake and he really should have left it in first gear and just used a bit of gas and perhaps high RPMs to go a bit faster when needed and in the end you're not driving a very long distance or time that way so who cares about the engine revving a bit it's way better to do that than to risk overheating the brakes so that's a bit of a lesson for anybody else trying that trip now luckily we did have no trouble and what we did was spend another half hour or so at the visitor center letting the brakes cool down and eating some sandwiches and having something to drink while we waited. So that was a bit of information that hopefully is useful to you if you want to go visit the telescopes on top of Mauna Kea on the big island of Hawaii. It's always sad when a excursion like that comes to an end, and more so when the vacation comes to an end. But I will leave you with one final photo from my flight out. It's always neat to see the telescopes on Mauna Kea from the air, and when the seatbelt sign goes off at 10,000 feet, knowing that they are still 4,000 feet higher than you, and more importantly, that you were actually up there a few days ago. So, I hope you found this video enjoyable, and see you next time.